Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Phillies Talk podcast presented by Team Toyota. I'm Corey Simon, and he's Jim Salisbury. And here we are about 10 days before opening day. Uh, and the Phillies, just a slew of injury news as this weekend opened. Um, a lot of it good news. And let's start with the most important players, uh, JT Real Muto, Zach Eflin. What can you tell us about those two, Jim? Does it look like uh, – one or both could be ready for opening day. Real Muto dealing with a thumb injury and Eflin with a back issue. Yeah, we're going to find out more here in the coming days, but both guys seem to be moving in the right direction, according to Joe Girardi. Um, you know, we know how important Real Muto is. Uh, broke his thumb uh, last month. He's, uh, you know, doing all baseball activities, uh, taking BP, facing live pitching. He's throwing up to, I think, 150 feet and uh, running the bases and doing everything. So everything looks good. Um, you know, Joe uh, said he's healing and said the fracture is stable, where the fracture was. So they hope to get him in some games here next week, uh, starting off as the DH before he works his way behind the plate. I would think that would give him ample time to be ready for opening day um, and uh, be behind the plate on opening day. Maybe, you know, get a day off in that first couple days with Andrew Knapp uh, filling in as they kind of watch him a little bit. But it sounds like good news on Real Muto. Sounds like promising news on Eflin, who had uh, had a back flare-up last weekend. Uh, he was uh, throwing uh, up to about 120 feet on Friday, hopes to throw a bullpen on Sunday. I think Today, Saturday, we might hear if that bullpen is going to happen. If that bullpen happens Sunday and um, he feels good, he's able to make uh, his next start in spring training, I would think that would put him on track to uh, open the season on time. They actually have a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, they wouldn't need a fifth starter until game six against the Mets. So you could push him back conceivably two full days. You can buy him a little bit of extra time if you needed to. So I would think the chances of those two, as you mentioned, important guys uh, for opening day are looking pretty good, uh, you know, barring a, another setback or something. But uh, there seems to be some encouragement there. And there's a whole slew of other guys. I'm sure you have that list, right? Yeah. Before we get to the other guys on that list, I wanted to ask you, like, have you thought about where Real Muto might slot best into this lineup? Like looking at the Phillies top six of Andrew McCutcheon, Reese Hoskins, Bryce Harper. JT, DD, and Alec Bohm. You know, they didn't begin last season with Bohm. He came up about three weeks into the season. But just looking at that top six, like, is it possible Real Muto could be batting sixth? Because you'd probably want to split up the lefties if you can, ideally. And I mean, Bohm has just been such a productive bat, especially with runners in scoring position, that you could really put him in any of those slots, four, five, six. Yeah, I agree with you. I think you need to split up the lefties. I think Joe did that a, last, a lot last year split up Harper and Gregorius with Real Muto. Yeah, as he's getting his uh, legs, you might put Bohm fourth. Uh, big assignment for a young guy, but he's got his uh, feet on the ground and his head screwed on straight. I think he can handle it, right? Uh, we saw what he did with runs in scoring position last year. I think he – did he lead the majors? He hit 452. I think he led the majors. So he run did. In, yeah, he uh, led the majors running in scoring position. No moment seems really too big for him. Uh, he's got that nice kind of even-keeled heartbeat, as they say. Um, and he's a disciplined guy, so I don't think he's going to, you know, you throw him in that that kind of glamour hole in the lineup. I don't think he's going to try to do too much. So I could see them breaking in Real Muto at six, and I would like him there. I'll tell you what, that's a pretty, you know, you start that, you're, you're looking at a, a lengthy lineup, right? Uh, pretty good lineup. Uh, Joe likes Hoskins, too. Um, you know, McCutcheon won. Uh, he likes to get Harper up in the first inning. And uh, I don't blame him. Get him there in that three hole and, and then go from there. So not really sure what he's going to do. Um, but certainly that is conceivable. Yeah. Jim, you always, you know, say that things have a way of working themselves out in spring training when it comes to like roster issues and having too many guys for too few spots. And under normal circumstances, a Zach Eflin injury could have led to more opportunity for Vince Velasquez or Spencer Howard. But they're also dealing with injuries now, too. So what's yeah. the latest on them? So Spencer Howard also had some back problems. Uh, his were spasms, uh, lingered throughout the week. He was able to throw on Friday up to 120 feet. Joe reported progress. Um, they hope to get him on a bullpen mound Sunday, and that'll determine which way they go with him. You know, I'm still not sure if his fit on the roster. 
look, if Eflin's not ready by game six and Spencer Howard is, I guess he could fill that spot. I, I think he, he there's a chance he might not even make the team. You could slow him down a little bit because of this back problem. Start him in the um, that auxiliary holding tank that they're going to have before AAA. Uh, or is the chance he's in the bullpen, uh, maybe piggybacking with um, somebody like um, Chase Anderson? I just don't know. We're going to see it over here over the last 10 days where he exactly fits in. Uh, but it is good news that he's at least feeling better at progressing in the right direction. Uh, Velasquez, according to Girardi, had um, a, tweaked his back last, was it Sunday, warming up for a simulated game. Now, usually, if you tweak something, I'm sorry, it was his oblique. I'm sorry, it was his oblique. Uh, I can't keep all these torso injuries <laughs> um, straight in my mind. So he apparently felt something in his oblique warming up last Sunday. And, you know, at that point, you kind of should tell somebody, but he plowed through it, went out and pitched a simulated game. The next day reported that his oblique wasn't feeling good and said he did it before his sim game and in the warm up. I mean, ideally you kind of shut it down then, but anyway, he's being treated for a little bit of an oblique um, issue. According to, to Girardi, He's probably behind Eflin and Howard. So that obviously I would think eliminates him from being a fill in if, if Eflin is not ready, uh, it, depending on how his final days at camp go, it could create a DL situation or IL situation. It could, you know, I don't think it's any secret. They're very open-minded um, to listening on trade offers for Vinny Velasquez, but you know, it's hard to trade a guy when, you know, he's, He's not 100% healthy. Um, I certainly would be very wary of that um, if I were the other team, even, even if it wasn't an arm issue, issue. I'd want to see him back on the mound healthy. And the other thing is maybe he gets healthy quick and, and ends up in, in the bullpen. So I'm just not sure how, how those two guys are going to fit in. And uh, it's, it's very complicated because a lot of guys in that bullpen have pitched really well that have, have sort of earned their way onto the team. Um, Another big injury, you know, not, I shouldn't say another big injury, but, you know, a big name who we were watching was Didi Gregorius. He went into concussion protocol after being hit in the back of the head by a pitch. He was kind of grazed, but nonetheless hit in the head, always scary. I think it was on Monday. Tuesday. Um, Tuesday, I'm sorry. Uh, but he went through the protocol, passed everything, actually is back in the lineup on Saturday. That is very good news. So, uh, you know, he's your starting shortstop. You need him, right? And hey, speaking of great teams, Team Toyota is leading the way with their new and pre-owned Toyotas right now. Their process is fast, easy, and it puts you in control the whole way. Just check out the reviews online. With locations in Langhorne, Glen Mills, and Princeton, visit teamtoyota.net and be safe, be strong, be a team. You know, talking about Vinny there, you can kind of understand why he didn't report the injury right away. Ideally, you want a player to do that right away, but there's so much uncertainty with him. Like he's competing not only for a spot on this pitching staff, but he's hoping to compete for a spot on another pitching staff if he's traded. Um, so, you know, that, 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 that has to be playing on his mind. Yeah. Uh, but you have an obligation to, to protect your health. Um, you know, you make your living with your body. And if it's not hundred percent, I think you have an obligation to speak up. I think you have a responsibility to the, to the people who are relying on you to speak up so they can treat you. So a 10 day or a two week uh, injury doesn't turn into a three week, four week, five week injury. Um, so, um, you know, I, I've been around long enough to see guys kind of hide things and that doesn't always sit well with management. They, they like you to speak up so they can kind of nip it in the bud. I know the, comp I know the soul of the competitor, you want to keep plowing through and make it happen. And, uh, but sometimes, you, you know, it's hard to do, but you, you know, you, you do have a responsibility to yourself and the team speak it up. So, I mean, they have these very sophisticated athletic training staffs of, you know, four or five, six guys that can really go to work on you. You, you better off speaking up. Um, so you don't do more damage to yourself, ultimately more damage to the team. But uh, yeah, I, I do know what makes a competitive tick and sometimes that's hard to do. So it's, it's a tough one. Well, well, if Vince Velasquez or Spencer Howard or both uh, are not on the opening day roster, I would just looking through like the projected potential bullpen members, I would think the guy who benefits the most from that would be David Hale. Right. I mean, he's 
kind of here as a long man. That's the role that he would serve. And there are several guys who are locks for this bullpen, like the top half of the bullpen, you know, Archie Bradley, Hector Neris, Jose Alvarado, Connor Brogdon, you can pretty much put those guys in, in marker. Uh, the other half of the bullpen, some spots up for grabs. But if Vince Velasquez or Spencer Howard are unable to be on the opening day roster, it, it increases the importance a little bit of a long man. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I would definitely agree with that because both of those guys have been stretched out and could do that uh, job if you needed somebody. Uh, you know, Hale's pitched really well this spring. He's done a good job. Brian Mitchell's pitched really well. I mean, those are two under the radar guys. And then we haven't even gotten into Coolrod, who's on the 40. Um, he's got options. Maybe the team would employ one of those minor league options. Um, Tony Watson, Friday night, pitched very well. Kinsler has pitched well, uh, except for one hiccup. I mean, they both have track record. The team signed them late. They give you different looks. I still think there's a pretty good chance they end up on the roster. Um, Rondon, uh, Hector Rondon, sort of has uh, pitched better since Joe Girardi maybe challenged him a little bit. So he's another guy on a minor league deal that they would have to get on the 40 if, if they decide to keep him. So a lot of, a lot of balls in there, a lot of uncertainty. Um, we're going to get some more certainty this week because with a guy like, um, well, with a guy like Rondon, Kinsler, um, and Tony Watson, and even like Matt Joyce, because they ended last year on big league deals, uh, on big league contracts in the majors, I should say, um, and signed minor league deals this spring, you know, they have the, uh, the by CBA, by the agreement between the union and the, and the league, they have the right to, you know, get a little uh, heads up on their status in the final week of camp, like five or six days before opening day. They can go to the team and say, hey, I, I'm going to opt out if I'm not on the 40. Can you let me know if I'm on 40? And the team has to let them know if they're going to make the 45 days ahead of time. Or if they're unsure, they can say, well, we'd like to send, send you to the minors. In that case, they have to pay them a, what's called a $100,000 retention bonus. So we're going to get some clarity, you know, something approaching clarity on those three or four guys early this week. I think the 24th or 5th, I have to look at the calendar. But, um, you know, Joyce, um, you know, I think he's got a pretty good shot to make the team. And uh, I think Kinsler and, and – um, and Tony Watson do, and we'll see about Rondon. Tony Watson, you know, it's funny. I, we just were writing about um, Rayel Cormier recently, who passed away last week. Very, very sad. He was a tremendous guy. Uh, spent six years with the Phillies. Really enjoyed covering him. Um, real, real gamer. Real great competitor. Tough competitor. And the more I watch Tony Watson, he really reminds me of Real Cormier, even like his mechanics, kind of his delivery point, his, his kind of release point, uh, even his repertoire, you know, spot the fastball, not overpowering, spot the fastball. Real had a great splitter, which he threw, you know, as his quote unquote change up, but it was a splitter. And it really kind of faded away from right-handed hitters. And Tony Watson throws that change up that does the same thing. So, Kind of reminds me a little bit, even in size and, and approach to pitching, of uh, the late great Real Cormier. So, but we'll have um, some, I think some, something like I said, approaching clarity here this week about some of those um, non-roster guys. Well, you know, it's interesting with Tony Watson that from 2019 to 2020, he lost like three and a half miles per hour on his fastball, and yet he's 35. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it's, it happens. I just what's interesting is that he still remained pretty effective last season. He had a pretty good year. Um, locate, locate, locate. Yeah, so locate. yeah, if you're a lefty who can spot the fastball, you know, you don't necessarily need 93, 94. And his experience late in games and as a lefty specialist uh, could be beneficial for the Phil. So, like, if you think about it, all right, we mentioned that top half of the bullpen, those four guys who were locks in Bradley, Naris, Brogdon, Alvarado. Um, I think we both agree that Kinsler and Watson have a very good shot to make this team, right? I would think so, yeah. And then, you know, David Hale potentially is the long man. Uh, who do you think is that that final spot? Because Joe Girardi said that he wants to have an eight-man bullpen. Could that be Coonrod? Uh, could it be a third lefty like a Jojo Romero? I would think they'll both be in play. That, that decision will come down to, you know, the last few days here. Um, 
you know, depending on where the health is of Velasquez and Howard, that's going to play into it. Um, depending on Rondon, if he's there. Uh, again, potentially getting five guys in the 40s is going to be, yeah. going to be, going to be hairy. Um, but Coonrod or um, JoJo would be interesting guys. Uh, JoJo, obviously, is a left-hander, had some ups and downs last year, so opened some eyes, but then didn't finish real well. Coonrod uh, really throws hard from the right side. You acquired him in a trade. They both have options. So it kind of – I think a lot of it depends on um, – you know, where they are, if Watson makes the team, do you need a third lefty? Um, th things like that. Um, if, you know, if you feel like you need another hard thrower down there in Coonrod, um, maybe maybe he's the guy. I, I don't know how it's, it's all going to piece together. Really curious to see how it pieces together, but I think we have a really good feel on four guys that are going to be there. And um, the personnel's better, the ingredients are better. Um, this bullpen has nowhere to go but up because they were so horrendous last year. But uh, I really think they could, they can be significantly better just by the personnel they've they've brought in and, and and where they are. Yeah, the guy at the pizza place across the street from me. Every time I go in to pick something up, he asks about that bullpen, and every single time he says, "Hey, they can't be worse than they were in 2020," and that's literally true. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. They like. Pizza, there's no such thing as bad pizza. You know, even bad pizza is good pizza. But bullpens, you got good ones and then you got, you know, bad ones. The Phillies had a really bad bullpen last year. It was like, you know, I don't even know where that, that analogy is going. But so, like, the worst, you're saying like the worst pizza is the equivalent of like a 3.50 ERA. It's still pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Like, pizzas, even bad pizza is good pizza, right? But, uh, they well, they need they need to they need to have a good pie this year out in that bullpen. <laughs> um, all right, so two other so moving from the bullpen to the bench, uh, Brad Miller, who's also dealing with an oblique strain, that was also somewhat surprising news too that it's possible he could get into games by the end of the week. I mean, we were thinking that typically oblique means a month, but maybe he's making progress a little quicker. Yeah, we'll see. There's something to monitor, and that that connects throughout the entire. Uh, decision-making process on the position player side. I would think it would impact Scott Kingery unless he's the opening day center fielder. But if he's the first utility guy off the bench or it's him and Miller, that could impact what happens with Kingery. Um, still don't know if he's going to make the club or go to AAA. He's working on those strict swing adjustments. Um, you know, Joe has said that quality of at-bats is going to really matter in the uh, center field competition, which is basically between Kingery uh, Odubel Herrera, Roman Quinn, and Kingery struck out a bunch, but he's in the starting lineup on Saturday, as well as Roman Quinn. Um, we'll see what happens. I, th those guys are really under the microscope here, really, un really under the microscope. But yeah, if Brad Miller's uh, back by the end of the week, I'm sure they'd be happy with that because they brought him in to be a significant piece off their bench. And if these guys aren't ready, I think you can backdate um, a 10 day DL assignment three days. So you'd only miss the first six games. So we've talked about this before. I think it's always good to really nip the injury in the bud, even if you have to be a little conservative, miss a few days at the, at the outset, rather than, you know, having it uh, linger and turn into something bigger down the road. And those are the questions that they're going to be faced with here uh, in, in the first few days um, of, the, of the season. You mentioned Kingery in the center field battle there. Um... Odubel Herrera is part of that center field battle. And while, while the results have been pretty good for Herrera this spring, he's also swinging at a lot of garbage, which when he's, you know, not playing well, that's kind of what you see at the plate from him. And center field is like a more plentiful position, especially offensively now than it has been for like most of baseball's history. And I'm just, I'm just thinking like, given how much the Phillies are invested into winning this season and the, um, uncertainty over whether any of those four guys in the center field battle can produce enough offensively. Like that seems like a position that could be ripe for a, an in-season trade. You know, it probably is something you can find without having to cost you a ton, especially if you're looking at like a rental type. And I just wonder if these guys that we're talking about so much in the center field battle, I wonder if, you know, those are even going to be the main contributors at that position midway through the season. Well, maybe not, maybe not. I mean, this team is We've got a big payroll over 200 million. Uh, they are in it to get to the postseason, and they need to get to the postseason. And they have a wheeler and a dealer 
at, in the driver's seat now in uh, Dave Dombrowski. And if he senses that one move can get them to the postseason, I guarantee you he's going to go out and make it. And if none of those three guys have seized that position in center field and that's holding them back, he'll go out and upgrade it. Uh, I don't, I don't see no doubt in my mind he would do that. So there's an opportunity there for somebody to seize it, but uh, right now uh, nobody really has, but it's spring training. Um, I still think Odubel has the, the, the inside track. Um, he, it's funny. He, he can be, uh, his selectivity can be an issue. And then there was that one year when it was just on point. Remember that? For like six weeks to start the season. Yeah. And it's all about focus. It's all about focus. It's all about, you know, concentration and, 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 and focus and not letting your mind go all over the place. And, um, it, it's such a mental game, you know, all sports are required to play at this level. You have to be so physically and mentally sharp. Uh, and you know, if you're not mentally sharp, it, it can, it can manifest itself. I think in, in some hitters in, in the chase, chasing bad pitches, as you say. So there's no excuse for it. Um, especially with the guy who he's got a lot of, a lot of at bats, got, got, significant experience and he's shown he can do it you know he's shown he can be selected um if he wants to play in this team he's going to have to do it because they're, they're looking at quality at bats and and he might be he might win this job and he might kick it away by the end of april right if he's not focused or whoever gets that job so they're going to be constantly evaluating in center field and i agree with you uh it could be a position ripe for an upgrade if, if they feel like it's holding them back i mean that's the that's the attitude they have to have pretty much at every position right because they need to get to the get to the postseason i mean i know it's hard to have that you got you know long-term commitments behind the plate and that shortstop in right field uh it, you know it's tough to move aside guys like that but i expect those guys to all be you know producers so it shouldn't be an issue but uh, any of those guys in that tenuous position, you don't produce, they're going to replace you. Well, that center field battle is in crunch time now. Both games this weekend on NBC Sports Philadelphia, and then the Phillies enter the final week of Grapefruit League play. They actually have four night games next week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, as they prepare to come north for opening day, April 1st, against the Braves. And I know we've talked about it before, but those first two weeks – 13 straight games against the Braves and the Mets, your two biggest competitors. So the Philly season is going to start pretty fast. Uh, he's Jim Salisbury. I'm Corey Seidman. We'll talk to you early next week.